the ambitions. We're gonna annihilate him. The infighting. Bring him on. The betrayals. I think he's failed as a candidate. The race for governor had more twists and turns than a soap opera. Andrew Cuomo ended up the victor, but the real life drama played out in the months before election night. Now we're going behind the scenes to show you what the public didn't see. It's your all access pass to the race for governor. There were plenty of familiar faces among the Nassau County Republicans gathered at the Crest Hollow Country Club. They all came to this fundraiser to enjoy themselves and to hear Chairman Joseph Mondello praise his favorite for governor. With the state Republican convention only a few weeks away, candidate Rick Lazio looked to bolster his support. The real Republicans in the governor's mansion. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the next governor of the state of New York, Rick Lazio. Lazio had been the early favorite for the nomination to become governor, a job once held by such Republicans as Nelson Rockefeller and Teddy Roosevelt. But by May, the support around Lazio had splintered and he faced three challengers, including Suffolk County Executive Steve Levy. Whoever gained the GOP nomination would likely face Democrat Andrew Cuomo in November. Going into his party's convention, Lazio hoped to hang on as the favorite and avoid a costly primary fight. Part of Lazio's problem was money. He had collected only $640,000 by January 2010, and that made many in the GOP nervous that his campaign wasn't catching fire as it should. I wouldn't say I'm an extrovert at all. I would say I'm probably more somewhere in the middle of the, of the pack in terms of uh, social anxiety or social uh, comfort. Uh, raising money was a whole different story. When you're on the campaign trail, it, it means it's, it's a whole dedicated part of the job. It's nothing I ever loved doing, uh, and I still find it one of the, the less fun parts of running for office. Lazio was once a boy wonder in Suffolk politics, first elected to Congress in 1992 by beating longtime incumbent Tom Downey. But Lazio's race in 2000 for the U.S. Senate against Hillary Clinton proved his undoing. During a pivotal moment in a televised debate against the then First Lady, Lazio went up to Mrs. Clinton and demanded she sign a pledge against soft money donations. Instead, Lazio came off looking like a bully. Well, the most important lesson I learned in my 2000 race against Hillary Clinton was stay at the podium. <laughs> so uh, we'll never make that mistake again. After spending a decade working on Wall Street, Lazio's bid for governor this year was supported by many prominent Republicans, including Mondello. But in March, state GOP chairman Ed Cox and Suffolk chair John J. Laval, who once backed Lazio, decided to instead support Steve Levy's bid for governor. Levy was a Democrat who agreed to switch parties. Laval said he lost confidence in Lazio and wanted a better candidate to face Cuomo. Well, I think he's failed as a candidate. Uh, we got behind Rick Lazio because he was out of office for 12 years. He wasn't in touch with anyone. No one knew him anymore. And the reality is he came to me. He asked me to endorse him. I told him that I would for the purpose of allowing him to get his campaign off the ground, raise money, and get support around the state. He didn't raise any money, he didn't get his campaign off the ground, and he wasn't getting any support around the state. The reality is, we did him a favor, and he didn't make good on our end. So what we decided to do when a better candidate came along, which Steve Levy is a better candidate, we had to back that candidate. It's not backroom deals that's going to rule the day here. You know, the bottom line is the best candidate needs to be there for the Republican Party. That's how we're going to win. This slap in the face left Lazio, who had spent his whole life in the Republican Party, feeling betrayed. You find, out, you find out really by people sort of beginning to share bits of information, things that they have heard, 
And it wasn't a surprise to me because uh, I had come to believe that John Laval was moving in a different direction. That's why rounding up the support of Nassau Republicans at this fundraiser was so important to Lazio and his campaign manager, Kevin Fullington. In speaking to this crowd, Lazio didn't even mention Steve Levy's name. We're not even focused on him at all. We're focused on taking the fight to Andrew Cuomo. We're talking about the core principles and the core issues um, that Republicans have always stood for and that the people of this state are hungry for. So that is what we are focused on, is Andrew Cuomo and the general election. And we're not focused about some of this internal Republican politics. Going into the Republican convention, Lazio acted confident among his supporters, but privately he hoped to overcome the mounting opposition in his own party. That it's not for the faint of heart. That this is a this is hardball politics in New York. It's a toxic political atmosphere. And there are a lot of people that don't tell you the truth. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why both political institutions and politicians are are held in, in ill repute. They're 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 not trusted by the public. Welcome. Please enter your access code followed by the pound sign. You entered one zero six two six three zero. If this is correct, press one. There are eight participants in this conference. This conference is now being recorded. Please announce yourself. This is Steve Levy. Thank you everyone for joining on with us today. It is early on a Tuesday morning and Suffolk County Executive Steve Levy is making himself known during this teleconference to reporters from around New York State. From Buffalo News. Sorry, sorry, Tom. And, uh, uh, yeah, I've been there many a time over the last uh, month, coming back over the weekend, in fact. Only a few weeks earlier, Levy had renounced his role as Suffolk's top Democrat and switched parties, hoping to grab the Republican nomination from Rick Lazio and other contenders. With a war chest of $4 million, Levy aimed his long shot bid at eventually challenging Andrew Cuomo in the general election. I really believe that I have the best skill set and the best knowledge of the state with the most solutions. So I said, I'm gonna give this a stab. Levy had been a Democrat his whole career, serving as a county legislator, then a state assemblyman, and eventually a Suffolk's two-term county executive. But this was the year Levy wanted to run for governor, and he wasn't sure how. Initially, incumbent Governor David Patterson planned to run, and Levy hoped to gain the Democratic nomination as a long shot against Patterson and Cuomo. But when Patterson dropped out, Levy decided his best chance was with the Republicans, particularly after talking with state GOP leader Ed Cox and others about Rick Lazio's campaign. Well, Ed Cox was astute enough also to realize that they were going down in flames. They just didn't feel that Rick Lazio's campaign was gaining any traction. There was no money, there was no excitement, there was no background about being a fiscal manager, and there was no plan to change New York. It was just like, hey, vote for me because I ran for a statewide office 10 years ago and I'm a nice guy. And they were saying, well, we really don't want to settle, you know, but no one else is coming forward. So they kept on hoping that someone else of gravitas would come forward. They waited for a Giuliani, it didn't happen. They waited for a Pataki, it didn't happen. Uh, and then they just said, look, we're gonna get killed. Uh, Steve Levy's the guy who can win this thing and it works out well because he's the kind of guy we should be attracting over to our side anyway if we want to grow our tent. When Levy switched parties though, many Democrats cried foul, saying he was more motivated by personal ambition than by principle. The concept of him becoming a Republican is outrageous. And to think that a man that I contributed money to, I gave the man $150, uh, it, you know, is, is using my money in effect to, to, to uh, support his candidacy against the Democratic candidate, it's outrageous. Critics like Democratic Party Executive Charlie King said Levy had no future as a Democrat seeking statewide office because of his stance on immigration. Steve Levy uh, has a number of policies and positions uh, that would make it impossible for him to get a lot of support within the Democratic Party. His comments and his jokes 
on immigration and other issues can be divisive and polarizing. And I don't think that that helped him at all within the Democratic Party. We'll see what the Republican Party does with him. These guys aren't with me anyway. I'm with the people. I'm with the taxpayers. I don't care if they have a D or an R after their name. I'll side with anybody who's going to side with the taxpayers. The hardest part of the change was when dealing with friends, you know, people who believe in me and I believe in them. And, uh, you know, they were in my house sticking, you know, putting stickers on the envelopes and sealing the envelopes. You know, they understood because they knew I'm that kind of fiscal conservative. But there's, you know, uh, they they can't be on the same side anymore because they've been Democrats all their life. And there's that, that uneasiness. By March, when Levy announced his bid for governor on the steps of the state capitol, he was joined by state GOP chairman Ed Cox and by Levy's main backer, Suffolk chair John J. Laval. But Long Island's most powerful Republican, Joe Mondello from Nassau County wasn't there, nor was he pleased. I've had a lot of conversations with John. John and I have been friends for years. Uh, we've talked on the phone a number of times. Right now, not so much lately, because I knew which way he was going, and he knew which way I was going. But you know, it's nothing personal. I mean, it's just, it's just business. After so many years in politics, Steve Levy felt his timing was right and welcomed the idea of a fight for the nomination at this year's Republican convention. Was it a lock? No, but I knew that I would have a really pretty, a pretty good chance of becoming governor. And how many times do you get in your lifetime to be able to take advantage of that? And if you don't act while you have that chance, you'll forever regret it for the rest of your life. And let me tell you, does it put me in a more vulnerable position down the road if I'm unsuccessful? Sure it does. But you know what, if you're not willing to take a risk, you're not going anywhere. June 1st was the first day of the state Republican convention, but the last one for Steve Levy to round up last minute votes in his effort to become governor. As delegates checked in and got their credentials in the lobby, they were reminded that Levy's most prominent supporter, state GOP chair Ed Cox, was the son-in-law of the late president, Richard Nixon. In the lobby, Levy expressed confidence to the press and passers-by. In three months, he had traveled around the state, hoping to gain enough support at this convention. Both he and Cox had staked a lot on Levy's chances of overcoming favorite Rick Lazio and two other challengers. Also in the hotel was Carl Palladino, a wealthy developer from Buffalo who planned to spend up to $10 million of his own money to get enough signatures on the Republican primary ballot, even if he didn't win the party's designation at this convention. I think it's a very fluid group out there. There's a lot of people waiting to hear the speeches. There's a lot of people that have not committed uh, despite the fact that maybe their county chairs have committed to one or the other of the candidates. A last-minute entrant, Miles Murmel, a Manhattan businessman, decided about a week before this get-together that he'd rather run for governor than lieutenant governor. But the big drama at this convention involved Lazio and Levy, the two men who both got their start in Suffolk politics and were now vying for governor. Unlike Levy, Lazio stayed mostly out of sight, upstairs in a strategy room while his campaign manager, Kevin Fullington, worked the convention floor, watching Fullington carefully court Lazio's delegates. Keeping them in the fold and maybe peeling away some from Levy would be a chance to see democracy in action, how the sausage making of politics would play out. We've spoken to lots of delegates in Suffolk County, and we have, despite the local chairman working really, really hard against us and, and twisting lots of arms, we feel like we've done uh, good work in rounding up sufficient Suffolk County support to get Rick well over the barrier he needs to be. Throughout this first day, Laval tried to do everything he could to convince Republicans to support Levy, who had just converted from being a Democrat. When Laval successfully nominated Tea Party member Gary Bernson as the GOP Senate candidate to run against incumbent Chuck Schumer, some took it as a sign that Levy's forces might prevail. 
Behind the scenes, perhaps the biggest political struggle involves state chairman Ed Cox, who favored Levy, and Nassau's GOP chair, Joe Mondello, who supported Lazio and didn't want to see a primary between the two. Mondello had been the state chair until Cox replaced him last year. At one point, Cox came over to the Nassau delegation to talk privately, but Mondello seemed unmoved. Yeah, I know Steve Levy a long time, and on a personal basis, and I, th I think the guy's great. I just don't think he, he belongs on the, on the Democratic team working for the Democrats. He does not belong in our ballpark. It's as simple as that. I mean, he's, he's either a Met or a Yankee. He's not, he's not, he can't be both, you know? <laughs> By day's end, Lazio finally made his public appearance, predicting victory to the press, but not willing to say exactly where he'd get his votes. I feel great about where we are. I love the math. I think we're going in tomorrow uh, with a position of strength and momentum, and I fully expect to be the, the designee of the Republican Party. Do you have numbers that you can share, or would you predict? No, I'm not, I mean, no. I'm not, that's not my job to count heads. So my job is to be the candidate. That evening, Steve Levy had a cocktail party to rally support among his delegates. His wife, Colleen, was there, and his campaign team. For the chance to run for governor, Levy had renounced his party affiliation, angered many of his old Democratic supporters, and embraced the GOP leadership, hoping the convention delegates would follow. But whether Levy had enough votes to pull off his long-shot challenge remained to be seen. Decision day had arrived at the Republican convention, and the narrowness of the race between Rick Lazio and Steve Levy was now down to the nitty-gritty of vote counting. Levy felt certain he had at least 25% of the delegates needed in the first vote to be placed on the ballot for the September Republican primary against Lazio. But under the law, Levy hadn't changed his Democratic enrollment soon enough to qualify as a Republican. So on today's second vote, he needed 50% of the GOP convention delegates to approve his primary run against Lazio. Levy knew this wouldn't be easy. Well, you get commitments from folks, and a lot of them are going to hang until the last minute. Uh, but we feel very confident because many of these folks who uh, Mr. Lazio was counting in his camp, they just gave him a very tepid endorsement five months ago. That, oh, yeah, you're the only guy in a race, sure, you're the Republican candidate, yeah, yeah, put me down on your letterhead. Okay, that's different than having the committee people in that region lock in for you from the gut that they really believe in you. Uh, that is not there. We have not seen any of that. These people are very fluid. And ultimately, it's going to be hand-to-hand -hand combat. In these final minutes, Levy and his main ally, Suffolk GOP Chairman John J. Laval, pushed to secure promises from the undecided and from the wavering. One such example was Albany GOP Chairman John Graziano. When Levy announced his candidacy in March, Graziano was there by his side, along with Laval and state GOP chairman Ed Cox. But by decision day in June at the convention, Graziano had changed his mind. Levy and Laval lobbied hard with him in his last few minutes to stick with them. But when the voting started, Graziano's straddling of the fence became clear. On the first vote, all of Albany's delegates, including Graziano, voted for Lazio instead of Levy. But on the second vote, on whether or not to allow Levy to run in the primary, Albany's Republicans voted with him, including Graziano. Eventually, Levy got 28% of the first vote, enough theoretically to earn a spot on the primary ballot. But Lazio and his campaign manager, Kevin Fullington, worked hard to make sure that Levy didn't get the 50% he needed on the second vote, allowing him to run technically as a Democrat on the GOP ballot. Their biggest ally, Nassau GOP Chairman Joe Mondello, argued that a primary would only split the party. And all we're going to do is lose money, lose time, lose ethic, and maybe lose the election because of it. So no, I'm not for the primaries, uh, primaries at all. Give me no primary every time and you'll make a happy man out of it. When all the votes were counted, Levy came close, but ultimately Lazio prevailed not only with Nassau's votes, but with a few from Suffolk as well. 
Ed Cox, the state chairman who had opened the door for Levy's challenge, now told the convention who had won. Lazio called this a great victory, though he had been an unchallenged favorite until Levy came along and shook up the party. Cox later held a post-convention news conference and declared his fidelity to Lazio, whose candidacy he once undermined. And Mondello, who could barely conceal his unhappiness with Cox, argued Lazio would be a better candidate for going through this ordeal. Somehow, all the raw emotion of ambition, betrayal, as well as principled calls to public service were on display at this convention. In defeat, Levy tried to act graciously towards those in his new party and not show any remorse. Listen, um, uh, I'm a big boy. I knew what we, I was getting into, and, and the process was fair. It was open, and I understand the rank and file perspective that he might have been committed to another candidate back in November or December of last year. It's a really tough thing. They asked someone to reverse their commitment to someone. Had we started earlier, I think we, we could have had more uh, possibilities of success in that regard. In this race for governor, Levy had gambled big against Lazio and lost. He alienated his old Democratic supporters, left his Tea Party fans high and dry, and faced an uncertain future as a Republican. But behind the scenes, the biggest struggle here was about who would control the party's future, as much as what candidate had the best chance to beat Democrat Cuomo in the fall. As this convention ended, an open question still remained. Who really had won? By Labor Day, Andrew Cuomo was the front runner for governor. And this time, everything about his campaign was going according to plan. At the West Indian Parade in Brooklyn, one of the city's largest, Cuomo's team carried banners and signs, handed out placards to would-be supporters, and let everyone know of the candidate's arrival. Andrew Cuomo! Andrew Cuomo wishes everyone a happy West Indian Day Parade! Cuomo worked this crowd like a pro, at age 52, New York State's Attorney General had spent most of his life in politics, the son of a former governor, Mario Cuomo. Instinctively, he went back and forth along the street, smiling and waving, touching hands, and reaching out among the more than one million people at this parade. Another politician at this parade was Democratic incumbent governor, David Patterson. Earlier this year, Cuomo looked like he'd face a difficult primary fight against Patterson for the nomination. But after a series of Albany scandals, Patterson decided not to run, and Cuomo suddenly had a clear Democratic field all to himself. For most of the summer, Cuomo seemed content to watch his potential Republican opponents fight it out among themselves. He cast himself as a reformer, vowing to clean up state government. You really have to focus on, and that this campaign is going to be about, is cleaning up Albany and making the state government work. It's not enough to have a federal government that's working. We need a state government that's working. So creating jobs, creating jobs, creating jobs, cleaning up Albany so we have a government that functions and that people can be proud of once again. This is Cuomo's second run for governor, another try for him after an unlikely comeback. In the 1990s, Cuomo seemed politically to lead a charmed life. He became President Clinton's housing secretary and married Kerry Kennedy, a daughter of the late Senator Robert Kennedy. But in 2002, his first attempt at running for governor was, by all accounts, a disaster. Too many people remembered Andrew's combativeness as his father's top advisor. Cuomo wound up dropping out of that race and then endured a messy divorce from Kennedy. Over the next three years, Cuomo earned two and a half million dollars in private life, working for Andrew Farkas, a real estate mogul whose projects included this Middle Eastern luxury complex built on a man-made island in Dubai. 
As Housing Secretary, Cuomo had once criticized Farkas for ripping off American taxpayers. But by 2005, they were partners in this project along with Dubai's royal family. In 2006, Cuomo came back to politics, running successfully for state attorney general. Farkas helped build up Cuomo's political war chest, which today has some $20 million in cash, far more than any opponent. But some still held a grudge against Andrew, like former mayor Ed Koch, who blamed him for tactics 20 years earlier in his race for mayor against Mario Cuomo. Koch refused to endorse Andrew for state attorney general until he first apologized. In the 77 campaign, uh, there uh, were signs uh, in Queens, a vote for Cuomo, not the homo. They're shocking, absolutely shocking. And I thought uh, that uh, Andrew, as the campaign manager, uh, was involved. Uh, he uh, told me he was not. So whether he was or he wasn't, and I prefer to believe him uh, that he wasn't, if he were, I forgave him. That's the end of it. I won! <laughs> As Attorney General, Cuomo has built a bulldog image by taking on abuses with pensions and other state programs. And in this race, he's cast himself as a fiscal conservative, willing to hold the line on taxes and spending. There are 10,000 local governments in the state of New York. Town, village, lighting district, water district, sewer district, a special district to count the other districts just in case you missed a district. <laughs> Republicans like state chair Ed Cox criticized Cuomo's tenure a decade ago at HUD, especially his handling of the federal Fannie Mae mortgages and as a culprit in the nation's housing collapse. The naivete of Andrew Cuomo was responsible for the financial collapse that occurred in September of 2008 because of what he did in setting regulations for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that required them to take loans for individuals who could not pay them back, creating the subprime market. Uh, that is right at the doorstep of Andrew Cuomo. Uh, I was HUD secretary. We were promoting home ownership. The administration that came in after the Clinton administration uh, was more aggressive in promoting home ownership. There was no evidence of a subprime problem for years and years and years after I left high But the biggest problem with Cuomo, says GOP gubernatorial candidate Carl Palladino, is that he's part of the permanent establishment in Albany, unable, he says, to clean up the mess in state government. Mr. Cuomo, despite his, his, his talk that he's a new conservative Democrat, uh, continues to be the liberal progressive he has always been in his life. This time, as Andrew Cuomo runs again for governor, a second chance at the big parade, he's convinced even past political foes to support him, including former Republican Senator Alphonse D'Amato. He has certainly gone through his trials and tribulations, and when people are tested under fire, he had some great political setbacks, um, they either uh, 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 overcome it um, or they, they go in the opposite direction. He's, he's worked to overcome it. And so I think he's much more open, much more deliberate. He doesn't uh, pretend to know everything. Um, there are very few people who, when they're young, will take advice from seasoned veterans who can say, watch out for these pitfalls, etc. So I think he's matured tremendously, much more open, doesn't um, come over like he knows it all. As Cuomo seeks to finally attain the same job his father held for 12 years, New Yorkers must decide whether he is a creature of Albany's politics or will Cuomo, as he promises, be able to change it. All right, let me see if I have change for you to pick it back. No. All right. Um, 24, right? 24. That's what I want. All right. Thank you. The Elks Lodge in Riverhead was ready five days before the Republican primary for Carl Palladino to rally his Tea Party support. Banners, bumper stickers, and T-shirts reflected their anger at big government and high taxes and their hope that Palladino could do something about it. When he arrived, Palladino and his top advisor, Michael Caputo, 
came armed with the latest poll results, showing that Palladino was within striking distance of the party's favorite, Rick Lazio. Whoever won the September primary would face Democrat Andrew Cuomo, the frontrunner in November's general election. Seemingly out of nowhere, Carl Palladino was taking New York politics by storm. Willing to spend up to $10 million of his own money, this Buffalo lawyer and real estate developer vowed to use a baseball bat to break up Albany's corrupt state government. Albany hears the rumble of the people's revolution coming down the road, and they're scared. And they sure ought to be. Palladino is not, by any means, a traditional Republican. After years as a Democrat, giving donations to such politicians as Hillary Clinton, he switched parties and tapped into the nation's burgeoning Tea Party movement. As a first-time political candidate, he pledged to cut taxes, reduce spending, and voiced anger about what he called a dysfunctional state government. But since then, there's been stories about Palladino's own judgment, including a child from an extramarital affair, forwarding racist and pornographic emails to friends, and comparing the state's assembly speaker to Adolf Hitler. I made mistakes in my life, I'm human. I don't know anyone who hasn't made mistakes. I'm not a career politician. I'm truly an outsider. I'm not politically correct, and I don't want to be. At times, Palladino seemed to worry Republicans more than the Democrats. He gathered thousands of petition signatures to force a primary vote. And at the party's convention in June, state GOP chair Ed Cox ignored Palladino and later questioned his fitness for office. And he is a fiscal conservative. Uh, he speaks that language in very strong terms. But there are times when the terms he has used has been too strong. Uh, and he has misspoken himself in a way that it would be uh, fatal in a general election. Another person who chose to ignore Palladino was the party's convention designee, Rick Lazio, who instead focused on Cuomo, as if he had already won the primary. You're running against who now? Andrew Cuomo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Andrew Cuomo can't change Albany because Andrew Cuomo is Albany. He can't, I can. He won't, I will. Rick Lazio, one of us for governor. But Lazio's effort was undermined by other Republicans, who said they were for him, like Nassau County Executive Ed Mangano, who came out and publicly supported Andrew Cuomo's tax plan. That same day, Lazio was also campaigning on Long Island and seemed genuinely surprised. I think we're to I'm totally comfortable with where we are. Uh, Ed Mangano knows and every person in, in, on Long Island knows uh, that there's only one candidate that's going to really watch out for Long Island. Another Republican, former Senator Al D'Amato, sat next to Lazio at a Nassau GOP fundraiser last May and told the crowd who to support. We are back stronger than ever, and we need a Republican at the helm of this state to stop the special interest groups and to stand up for the working men and women. And that will take place with Rick Lazio. But behind the scenes, D'Amato was already supporting Cuomo. He previously attended a fundraiser for the rival Democrat, convinced that Lazio couldn't win. Politics in this case was not only local, but personal too. D'Amato was angry that a decade earlier, Lazio had wanted the new federal courthouse on Long Island to be named for former President Teddy Roosevelt instead of himself. No, it didn't irk me. Uh, it infuriated me. I think he thought he would get more uh, accolades by having the courthouse named after Teddy Roosevelt. But I'm very pleased that it's a, it's a great courthouse to serve the people of Long Island. That uh, My name is on it and I'm, I'm very proud. But no thanks to Rick Lazio. Meet Rick Lazio, New York next governor, governor Rick Lazio. On primary day, with Palladino quickly catching up, Lazio shook hands with Long Island commuters, urging them to vote for him when they got home. But his campaign was nearly out of money and proved no match for the tsunami of support that Palladino had gained from Tea Party activists and upstate Republicans angry with state government. 
As the returns came in, everyone in Manhattan at the state Republican election headquarters watched Palladino, miles away in Buffalo, declare victory. Lazio managed to win the conservative primary that night, but two weeks later, he stepped aside so Palladino could run on both tickets, now as the main opponent against Andrew Cuomo. With election day near, Palladino says his Tea Party-inspired campaign will succeed because angry voters are seeking less government rather than the powerful looking to trade favors. With millions of his own to spend, he's trying to convince independents and Democrats of that message too. I think what's happened is that over the years, the party labels, uh, uh, they don't mean much anymore. I think the people recognize that. Uh, the people we've met, uh, they look at it more as a ruling class versus the people. The Cuomo camp says Palladino lacks the experience to make government work, that his promises to cut spending don't add up, and that he has insulted large groups of people in this increasingly nasty campaign. And there's no doubt Palladino sees the governor's race very much in personal terms, as a battle between himself as a political outsider and everything he despises about Albany. I've yet to walk out of a room that I didn't feel I had 100 percent of that room by the time I walked out of it. That's how, that's how big this thing is getting. We're not just going to beat these guys. We're going to annihilate them. And I mean that. Despite long odds and his own personal baggage, Palladino has shaken up New York's political world. In a year of increasing uncertainty, he's become the biggest wild card of all. Cut out the fat. The only debate of the governor's race took place at Hofstra University three weeks before Election Day. Along Hempstead Turnpike, supporters of Andrew Cuomo were out in force with all the signs of a campaign in high gear. Republicans were hoping their resurgence around the country would help them take the governor's seat. But Democrat Cuomo was still leading in the polls. Those favoring Republican Carl Palladino, the darling of the Tea Party, hoped this debate might turn around his chances. Since his come-from-behind victory in the GOP primary, Palladino had been trying to recover from self-inflicted political wounds, like his anti-gay comments. And I don't want them to be brainwashed into thinking that homosexuality is an equally valid or successful option. And this threatening confrontation with a reporter. I'll take you out, buddy. You're going to take me out? Yeah. How are you going to do that? Watch. I'll tell you, my campaign, I would just pay him to keep talking. <laughs> Put him on TV in my commercials. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. At this debate, instead of a serious face-to-face -face against each other, Palladino and Cuomo seem to get lost among the minor party candidates. Who can forget the former madam or the candidate from the Rent is Too Damn High party who stole the show? Rent is too damn high. Rent is too damn high. It's like the body of a car. It's the property. Jimmy McMillan is the engine of that car. As an outsider, Palladino also faced a struggle within his own party. In the campaign's last week, he appeared at a Nassau Republican rally embraced by County Chair Joe Mondello, who in the primary had backed another candidate, Rick Lazio. Are you guys mad? Yeah! Are you mad as hell? Yeah! Are you going to take it anymore? No! Are we going to do something about it? Yeah! Up on the stage, another Mondello ally, Nassau County Executive Ed Mangano, appeared to go out of his way to avoid shaking Palladino's hand. And Mondello found himself explaining why one of Nassau's best-known Republicans, former Senator Al D'Amato, was actually supporting Democrat Andrew Cuomo. Al is in the business world today, and you know, he's going to do what he has to do. He's always been a bit of a maverick, and I guess he always will be. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm 100% behind Carl Palladino. By election day, instead of the upset victory Republicans were hoping for, Cuomo beat Palladino by a nearly two-to-one margin, leading a Democratic sweep of top statewide races. After some humbling setbacks in his life, 
Cuomo had finally achieved the position he seemed born for, the same job as governor his father once held for three terms. Carl Palladino had proved himself a flawed candidate, but Cuomo also suggested the Tea Party's influence, felt in so many races around the nation, had been rejected in New York. They tried to put wedges in the beautiful mosaic that is New York. And they thought that they could separate us. And they thought that they could divide us. But they can't. As New York's next governor, Andrew Cuomo faces a huge budget deficit and a troubled economy more difficult than any time in recent history. The problems uh, facing uh, the state of uh, New York are much uh, greater than they were uh, when I was mayor. Uh, up to now, nobody has wanted to sacrifice. And what you uh, have to do as governor is to establish that you're willing to stand up to every special interest. At a labor rally just before Election Day, Cuomo indicated he's ready for these challenges. Tightening our belt is something that is just a way of life now, given this economy, for people all across the state. And the main point is government has to learn that lesson. Easy to say, but will it be hard for the new governor to do? Throughout the campaign, Cuomo managed to avoid getting pinned down on specifics. It's not clear what he'll do about rising costs for Medicaid, state college tuition, and the state pension system. But as governor, Andrew Cuomo will have to provide answers, even though New Yorkers may not like what he has to say.